Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out. So great to see such a, a full room, uh, but understandable given we're having a really great speaker this evening and really interesting topic. Um, so I would, uh, my name is Jordan Slowshower. I'm a fellow in uh, addiction research uh, psychiatry here and one of the co-founders of the Psychedelic Science Group. Um, and tonight we are having our, in our group's three plus year history, our first talk on ketamine, uh, which is surprising given that Yale has been such a powerhouse in, in research in that area. So it's about time. And this evening we have the pleasure of hosting Raquel Bennett, uh, who's a PsyD, a psychologist and ketamine specialist from Berkeley, California. She primarily works with people living with severe mental illnesses like severe depression, bipolar disorder, and suicidal ideation. Um, Dr. Bennett has been studying the antidepressant effects of ketamine since 2002 and lectures frequently on this topic. Um, she's founded the Korea Ketamine Institute and is the organizer of the Korea Conferences, which is an international meeting devoted to the use of ketamine in psychiatry and psychotherapy. She has a longstanding interest in the relationship between psychedelic experience and mood modulation. And tonight she's gonna take us on a tour de force through different models of working with ketamine, which is all the more timely given the recent FDA approval of S-ketamine. And so it will help us think about uh, the opportunities and challenges that that is gonna pose in the future. So we did get a little later start than usual this evening. I've asked uh, Dr. Bennett to speak for about an hour, so which takes us to what our, on the poster, our end time was about eight o'clock. So anyone who needs to leave at eight is more than welcome to, but Dr. Bennett has kindly agreed to stay for, you know, till about 8.30 uh, for question and answer period. So y'all are welcome to stay if you can for, for the discussion portion. So with that, uh, let's welcome Dr. Bennett. Thank you. Thank you so much. It, can you hear me OK? In the back, you're OK? Thumbs up? OK. It is such an honor for me to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, while I'm talking tonight, please feel free to help yourself to food and to do whatever you need to do. I want you to be comfortable. Let's see here. OK, let me try this. So before I get started with the meat of my topic, I just wanted to uh, offer a thanks to Dr. Slowshower, who arranged this talk and who's been incredibly helpful and kind in this process. Thank you. So uh, as Dr. Slowshower said, I'm a, I'm a psychologist and a ketamine specialist out of Berkeley, California. I uh, just came out here for, to New York for a, for a week to do some teaching. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. I actually just got off the train from Manhattan. Um, and as Dr. Slowshower said, uh, I mostly work with people who are living with severe depression or who are on the bipolar spectrum or who have active suicidal ideation. And uh, for me, this talk is really personal. It's academic, but it's also personal. Um, I had my own first experience with ketamine treatment in 2002, and it was profoundly helpful for me. And I got interested in the question of, what is this? And how is it doing that? And would it do that thing that it did that was helpful for me, which was r rapidly antidepressant and robustly antidepressant, would it do that repeatedly, or was it just a fluke? Uh, would it do that for other people? And my interest uh, grew from an interest into probably an obsession, uh, and bim, bam, boom, here we are. Uh, I, I want to add that it's just incredibly satisfying uh, to be here just after the S-ketamine approval, the FDA approval last week. Because when I started this 17 years ago, people told me, they, they told me I was nuts, first of all, and uh, for having an interest in a psychedelic medicine. But they also told me at that time, in 2002, that there was no such thing. It was impossible to have a rapid-acting antidepressant agent. But I stuck to my guns because I knew what I saw. And uh, as I said, here we are. And so it really feels very uh, satisfying and validating. 
So as you know, I'm a psychologist. I work with a team of medical providers. Uh, so we work together collaboratively. Uh, and somewhere in this crazy process, uh, I became the founder of CREA Institute. Uh, and I run CREA Conference, uh, which as you know, is the international gathering place for clinicians and researchers who are working with therapeutic ketamine. And I'll say more about that later. I'm really proud of the fact that I have no disclosures. I've taken no money ever from any pharmaceutical company, and therefore I can say whatever I believe to be true. Um, I guess this talk is going to be recorded, so you can ignore this slide. But I want to encourage you to take uh, pictures with your cell phone if you like. You can take a picture of every slide if you wish. It's not really necessary because the talk is being recorded, and I think they're going to put it online later. Uh, I also wanted to, kind of as a starting point, I wanted to let you know that uh, there's really a couple of different levels of training. So it takes me about six hours to train a clinician from scratch to be competent and skillful with using ketamine therapeutically. So this will be the first hour of, of a six-hour talk, essentially. Uh, so if you like me, I can come back and give you the other five hours. But uh, anyway, so it's, it's impossible to cover in, in a nuanced way all the information in just an hour. I'm going to do my best to give you a grand tour of the topic. But just know that there's some other stuff that we're not going to be able to get to tonight. Uh, and then, so I also have a, we're putting together a new uh, didactic clinical training. I do a lot of mentorship. As I said, I run CREA conference that happens in November in San Francisco. And uh, we also run an experiential study group. And I know this is controversial, but I want to mention it before I forget. So, you know, I'm, I'm trained as a psychoanalytically oriented psychotherapist. And if, and from my perspective, you really just can't be effective as a, as a psychoanalytic psychotherapist if you haven't undergone psychoanalytic psychotherapy yourself. And so by the same token, I think there's real value in providers having direct firsthand experience of ketamine while being observant of all pertinent laws um, as much as possible to know the milestones the internal milestones for the space, because it's a particularly unique and beautiful medicine. So I'm in favor of people having direct experience uh, when, that's, when that's possible. Last thing, last caveat, the information that's available is changing very quickly. And so giving this talk is kind of like trying to hit a moving target, because what I said six months ago, some of that is already outdated. And I'm sure that what I'm going to say in six months from now is going to be a little different than what you're going to hear tonight. But we're going to just do our best with it, and we're going to talk about the state-of-the-art information as it is available today. So this slide right here gives an overview of my whole talk, namely that ketamine is a little teeny tiny molecule that's primarily used as a surgical and procedural anesthetic. I think it's incorrect, though, to refer to it as a surgical anesthetic. You know, we've been doing that for a long time to give legitimacy to our work. Like we say, oh, but it's a surgical anesthetic. Like somehow that makes it more real. But I want to be really clear that we're not using ketamine for anesthesia in this application, in the use of ketamine to treat depression. And so it's misleading to use that language. If you refer to ketamine as a surgical anesthetic, it implies, by extension, that the person who's the most qualified to administer ketamine would be an anesthesiologist. And I think that's problematic in this situation. So we're going to recategorize it. The new category for ketamine is that we're using it as a glutamate modulator. Because that's actually what we're trying to do here is we're on a, if we're going to go in a medical model, uh, we're targeting the glutamate pathway uh, in terms of mood. So anyway, we've been using this, year f using this medicine for something like 50 years uh, for anesthesia and analgesia. And it turns out that it has some side effects, maybe they're not side effects, maybe they're main effects, but it has two other properties that we need to mention. Namely, that ketamine has rapid acting antidepressant effects. It can take place within minutes of administration. And it's quite robust. It lasts a week or two, sometimes more. And also, it's highly psychedelic and hallucinogenic and causes patients to report uh, frequently especially in the higher therapeutic dose range, that they believe themselves to be in the presence of God. How it's doing that, I have absolutely no idea. I couldn't tell you. Uh, but anyway, 
this right here, this one slide, is the overview for my entire talk. So everything else that I'm going to say is going to be a, an elaboration on this one slide. So if you've got this, then you're good. You can relax. You've got the main idea. Uh, the rest is just the details that go with it. So uh, I just want to add that I, this usually takes me about an hour and a half to give this full talk. I'm going to try to speed it up a little bit so that we get through everything or as much as possible. So bear with me. But just to say that ketamine is a little teeny tiny molecule. It passes easily through the blood-brain barrier. It's completely synthetic. It's actually a derivative of PCP, or angel dust, uh, first synthesized for its anesthetic properties. Uh, it's in the chemical category of aryl cyclohexylamine. I'm not even going to say the other one. But what's puzzling about it, or an interesting note, is that um, ketamine is the only highly psychedelic agent that you can name or that's known that doesn't have a natural analog. In other words, there's nothing on Earth that we've found to date that hits the same pore in the same NMDA receptor that does the magic thing that ketamine does. And so that just, just to take a moment to ponder that, how did it get there? I mean, why is there a lock in your brain that doesn't have a key? I really don't know. I just, just want you to think about it. And this lock, this, this pore on this receptor, appears to do two really important things that we're going to talk about. Namely, it controls your perception of physical pain. And it controls the illusion of separateness. And when you have ketamine in your system, it becomes undeniably clear that everything is connected. I'll say more about that later. I'll just let you think about that. So now that S-ketamine has been FDA approved last week, it becomes really important that we talk about a particular property of ketamine called chirality. And you may remember this if you took chemistry at some point in the past. Uh, here's what it is. It, chirality is a property of things, both molecules, but also things in nature where they are mirror images of each other. They have the same components. Uh, but they are not identical. And so your hands are a good example of chirality. Ketamine is also chiral, so we're going to get to that in a moment. But let's just talk about your hands for a second. Uh, hopefully your hands have the same components on both hands, right? I'm hoping. Uh, and they're considered basically identical and the same, except that they're not. And here's why. Because you can't, you can't take your right hand and put it into a left-handed glove and have it fit correctly. And so chirality refers to that property of right-handedness and left-handedness, as I said, which exists in nature and in chemistry. So it turns out that ketamine is also chiral, meaning that the way that it's bent and the, where the little side chain sits, it has a, has a let me go back one, it has a um, carbon ring backbone and then some side, and then other side chains. So depending on where they sit, the molecule itself is considered right-handed or left-handed. OK, so that, that seems like a lot of technical detail. Raquel, why are we talking about this? Well, it has to do with uh, this, what's happened recently. So every pharmaceutical company in this country, everybody and their mother's brother, has been trying to create a ketamine derivative that they could patent for the, use of de for, for the treatment of depression. And they were not successful. If we had more time, we could go into that. But anyway, so Johnson & Johnson is smart. And what they did is they took, a, they took a batch of ketamine. So when you synthesize a batch of ketamine in the lab, what you end up with is a solution that has uh, equally left-handed ketamine molecules and right-handed ketamine molecules. So it's a mix of both, 50-50% each. OK, so what Johnson & Johnson did is they uh, took the solution and they filtered it, and they patented the filtration process. So what they did is they took this, this racemic mixture of left-handed and right-handed ketamine little molecules floating around. They ran it through a filter. They removed all of the right-handed ketamines. They're left just with left-handed ketamines, also known as S-ketamine or S-ketamine. And they called that a new product. OK, so does that work differently or better than racemic ketamine? I, I'm not so sure. Uh, but anyway, that's what it is. And I want you to understand what it is. S-ketamine, it's not a derivative of ketamine. It's filtered ketamine. Yeah? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, right on. Uh, there was something else I wanted to say about this. There are probably people in this room who have a knowledge of neuroscience that far exceeds mine, but I'll do my best. There's some question as to whether the receptors in your brain for ketamine, they may be right-handed and left-handed, but it's also possible that they're turtle-shaped and that they're both. It's also possible that they convert from right-handed to left-handed. So don't let anybody fool you like they know what's going on because they don't. Uh, it's not clear exactly what's happening with racemic ketamine versus S-ketamine. I want you to know that. This is why it's important that I don't have any disclosures, by the way. So I'm, I'm going to not say too much about the neuroscience of it. That's frankly not my forte. But just to say that uh, ketamine is working as an antidepressant in a totally different way than any of the antidepressants or SSRIs or SNRIs that you're familiar with. Namely, it's hitting the glutamate pathway. Glutamate is the most abundant neurotransmitter in your body. You probably knew that. Uh, it's not one of the sexy ones. It's not one of the ones that we talk about a lot with respect to mood. But it turns out that it's really important with respect to mood. Uh, ketamine also has some low affinity for the serotonin pathway, dopamine, opioid, acetylcholine, etc. I'm not going to go into that right now. I'm not going to go into that right now. OK. So it's a, <laughs> it's a little teeny tiny molecule, as I said. And uh, we can get it into the patient any which way you want it. So here I've listed the ways that ketamine is commonly used therapeutically, medically and therapeutically. And they're in de decreasing order of bioavailability and efficiency. So the best, you know, the most efficient way to put ketamine into a patient's body, either f for anesthesia or for the treatment of depression, uh, is through an IV infusion. That's about 97% bioavailable. Uh, IM injection is pretty similar. It's 93, 94% bioavailable. Okay, then the bioavailability drops significantly. By the way, uh, if you're, I know there are some folks tonight who are not physicians, so let me explain that. Bioavailability refers to how much of the medicine makes it to your brain and does something medical. Uh, and so each route has a different level of bioavailability. So the nasal administration, the nasal root insufflation, is estimated at like 40% bioavailable, but it's really variable and could be somewhere between 30 and 60% bioavailable. Uh, sublingual or transbuccal, so in the membranes of your mouth, is similar. Probably we're estimating it at the 40% range, uh, et cetera, and so forth. They decrease as they go down. The essential point here is that uh, you have to know the bioavailability of the route that you've chosen as a provider. Uh, to, and you've got to do the math. Because 100 milligrams intranasal or 100 milligrams of ketamine compounded into a lozenge is clearly not the same as 100 milligrams into the infusion bag or 100 milligrams IM. So you've got to do the math. You've got to know. We don't bother to convert them when we, do, when we talk about IM and IV because it's so close to 100%. But when you start getting into compounded lozenges or nasal spray, it's essential to know that the patient's only getting 40% of the administered dose. I have to say one more thing about this. I'm not a big fan, frankly, of uh, lozenges or nasal spray because it puts too much load on the excretory system unnecessarily. Why would you put two and a half more times of these metabolites that cause cystitis into the patient's body if you didn't have to? IM is way more efficient. Between you and me, I'm a control freak. I want to know exactly how much medicine we've administered. Uh, and so uh, we do mostly IM in our practice. Racemic generic IM, for the record. God, I hope there's nobody in here who was part of the patent for S-ketamine. Anyway. I used to spend a whole lot of time in my talks trying to convince people about how safe ketamine is. I no longer need to do that. Thank you, FDA. But anyway, there's a whole lot of applications, a whole lot of reasons that a patient might get, might get ketamine uh, in the ER or OR. Uh, it's considered one of the safer anesthetic agents if you really need an anesthetic. Uh, let's see, do I have anything else to say about that? Not really. OK, there we go. Hang on one second. I want to 
talk for a minute about the, the legality of this. So if you're a physician, you probably know this already. Oh, see, I have to change, update my slide. Check that out. So if you're a physician, you probably know this. But if you're not, let me just, let me just clarify something right here. So one thing that, people don't, that most people don't know, that the lay public doesn't usually know, is that there are actually three different agencies that control or have a say in what is considered legal. Most people think it's just one agency. That's, that's not the case. So let me say what they are. Uh, there's the DEA. That's the federal agency. And they have a schedule that, that says what medicines or substances you're allowed to uh, create or synthesize, manufacture, distribute, and prescribe. So according to the DEA, uh, ketamine is on something called Schedule 3, meaning that it's legal for the physician to prescribe it or utilize it as per their best clinical judgment. And most people think that that's the end of the story, but it's not. A different agency that gets to weigh in on this is the FDA. It, we all know what that is. Uh, FDA coverage is very closely tied to insurance coverage. So up until last week, ketamine was not FDA approved for any psychiatric indication, meaning that we were using it off-label for the last 17 years, and that was problematic in terms of insurance coverage and also our own liability insurance. It's a little unclear exactly what's going to happen with the whole S-ketamine, racemic ketamine thing. But what I really want to say is that there's a third governing body, which is the state, uh, state licensing board, that as a physician controls your li medical license, or as a psychologist, there's another board that controls our licenses. And if the state board doesn't like what you're doing, they can come in and they can examine your license or pull it. So I don't know how things are out here in Connecticut, but in California, they're pretty draconian and quite authoritarian. And so they just decide with what you're doing is ethical or not. And, then they, and if they don't like it, then they give you a hard time. So here's really what I want to say. As a provider working with ketamine and using it for an indication outside of last week's FDA approval, S. ketamine FDA approval, you're on pretty safe ground. You're not going to have a problem with the board if your client, if your patient meets the following three criteria. These aren't written down anywhere. They're just, it's formed by precedent. So here's the criteria and you're on safe ground if you're doing this, the patient has a diagnosable disorder with an observable functional impairment. That's criteria number one. The patient has tried and failed multiple attempts at conventional treatment. So that's a little vague, but you can see what they're getting at. And number three, that what you've done as a provider is up to the standard of the clinical community. What that means is that you can take the notes from that case with that patient, you can take it, and you can show it to another provider, and that provider would vouch for you and say, yeah, I would have done that. That seems like a reasonable course of action. So again, what I'm trying to say is, uh, if, you, if your patient meets these criteria, then you're pretty darn safe using ketamine any which way you please. That's your right as a medical provider. Mm -hmm. The place where I think we're stuck, or the, the kind of the growing edge here, is what do you do with patients who want psychedelic experience or want ketamine-facilitated therapy who don't meet those criteria, who don't have an access one disorder? So this is where things get confusing, because normally the DEA, the FDA, and the state boards overlap and agree perfectly in their understanding of how a medicine should be used. But with ketamine, they don't. So. I personally think that there's value in using ketamine as an adjunct to psychotherapy for any patient who would benefit from psychotherapy, like namely anybody. But uh, you know, it's not clear that the state board agrees with that, and nobody wants to be the test case on that one. So I want you to be thoughtful and understand that if you are using ketamine, any form of ketamine, outside of those three criteria, uh, that you need to be thoughtful about the potential ramifications for your license, okay? We, we do it. We do it in California. I'm going to go on video on record saying that we do it, but we do it very thoughtfully and very carefully. 
using ketamine as an adjunct to psychotherapy. Anyway, uh, let's see here. So there is a really substantial body of literature, much of it coming from Yale, uh, on the use of therapeutic ketamine to treat these conditions. Uh, so you can see them here. You, do, you need a little bit more if you're going to treat OCD. It usually takes a higher dose. Let's see where I am in time. OK, good. And uh, I just want to note here about the, the treatment of suicidality. Ketamine does something amazing. Uh, does something amazing for people who struggle with ruminative suicidality. I'm sure you've seen that in your practice. Uh, so those are patients who have had quite a bit of therapy and who continue to sort of perseverate on self-harm thoughts despite, uh, despite tr your attempts at treatment. That's what I mean by ruminative suicidality, Re recurrent. I don't think ketamine is useful in the treatment of acute suicidality in response to a stressor. For example, if you come home or the patient comes home and finds their lover in bed with the best friend and the patient feels angry and suicidal, ketamine is not going to help that. And so the idea of using ketamine in an ER, which is a stressful, noisy, often environment, uh, it, for people who, where their psychiatric history is unknown, and it's not clear if it's an acute suicidal episode or a recurrent one. I think that remains to be seen if that's going to be safe and effective. By the way, I took out all the slides and data and I took out all the numbers and stuff because you have access to the same body of literature that I do. So I hope that you'll look it up or let me know if you want specific citations. So these are the things that we are currently investigating. And the jury is still out. These are the conditions that we think ketamine might be helpful. There's been small studies or anecdotal reports or qualitative studies, but where it's not really firmly cemented yet in the academic literature. So let me run through some of that pretty quickly. So some folks seem to think that ketamine is helpful as an adjunct in the treatment of various substance use disorders, but in the studies where they've had the most success, namely Dr. Dakwar at Columbia and Dr. Krupitsky in Russia, they seem to feel that having some sort of residential treatment component is essential to the success of the treatment. So I'm, I'm not an addiction specialist. In fact, addiction or substance use disorder is a rule out for ketamine treatment in my practice. So I'm really, I, I, I'm not exactly sure where we're going to land on this one. Um, so I'm looking to you for more information. It, it, there, it, it's a question as to whether this is, uh, whether ketamine can be used in an outpatient environment effectively. I really just don't know. Uh, ketamine in the higher dose range gives people the opportunity to experience temporary disembodiment. We're going to talk about that in a moment. And so for that reason, it can be really useful for death rehearsal for people who are facing their own physical imminent death, or people who are processing the death of a loved one. Ketamine has a really useful application there. OK, anxiety is a tough one. We see a lot of folks who, have, uh, who present with depression with prominent anxiety. So we see that a lot, as I'm sure you do too. And here's the thing that's tricky about that. Uh, about half the patients report patients with depression and prominent anxiety. About half of them report that they find ketamine treatment to be really helpful, that it both addresses the depression, it has an uplifting component, but they also say it's like soothing and it, it relieves the anxiety for a while. But half the patients find it too agitating and it makes them worse. So you have to have an anxiety management plan in place if you're seeing someone with anxiety, with prominent anxiety and let them know that they may become agitated following treatment, uh, because otherwise they're going to be calling you all night. Uh, and so when we do training, we will get into exactly what the anxiety management plan would look like. So trauma, this is a really tricky category. And in order to be able to think effectively about what works, we really have to parse out different subcategories of PTSD, namely, uh, so here are some things to kind of keep in mind. Was the trauma relational and personal? Was it an act of God? Or was it accidental? Because that makes a really big difference, obviously, in the um, prognosis and treatment for the patient. 
Was it a single stressor? Was it recurrent? That makes a big difference, uh, et cetera. So I have reservations about using ketamine as part of the treatment plan at all for people who have, who have a history of dissociative trauma. Namely, that they dissociated, they, came, they felt like they were coming out of their body at the time of the traumatic incident. And here's why. Patients are smart. People, people are smart. And you give them some ketamine, which chemically induces dissociation or a feeling of separateness from your body. And people who have had a history with this remember that that feeling of coming out of your body is accompanied by something really terrible happening to you. And what you see is they clench. Not on purpose, but you can see it. They go, and they kind of like clamp down to try to avoid the dissociation. And they end up having unpleasant experience during the ketamine treatment itself. And if they're not open to it, it doesn't work. They don't get good benefit. So I have real reservation about this. I don't mean to say that you should never use ketamine for, for PTSD. Sometimes it's helpful. And I'll give you a quick example. Uh, clinicians who are studying... Um, Clinicians who have seen returning combat vets who come back with PTSD and depression, which is a really common combination, uh, they seem to do great. They seem to benefit greatly in general from ketamine as an adjunctive treatment. Well, why is that? Here's my theory. I have a hypothesis about this. Because, so the people who seem to benefit follow this profile loosely, which is the major trauma occurred after the age of 18. The personality is already formed. The trauma isn't personal. Nobody was trying to get that guy. Wrong place, wrong time. The landmine blows up. It's a horrible accident or a horrible event, but it's not relational. So in those kinds of cases, the ketamine is really helpful in treating PTSD. So I'm going to go back to my original point and say that you have to parse out different kinds of trauma to come up with an effective treatment plan. But I think it's incredibly unethical. I think it's unethical for providers to offer a ketamine, to say on their website that they're going to give an infusion of, sign the patient up for you know, six ketamine infusions for 6,000 bucks, and that they're going to relieve PTSD in the absence of therapy. That's nuts. So anyway, let's be cautious about that. I want to add one more thing here. The stronger the relationship, the therapeutic relationship between the patient and the therapist, the more love and trust mutually that exists there, the more leeway you have as a provider to do things that are challenging for the patient. So it's not that we never give ketamine treatment for the treatment of PTSD. It's that we do it really carefully and thoughtfully and embedded in the context of an ongoing therapy relationship. Anyway, back to this. Uh, People are looking at it for anorexia. You know, geriatric depression in this country is horribly underdiagnosed and undertreated. Ketamine is probably a better option than some of the other meds because it has fewer interactions. OK, I'm not a big fan of giving medication at all to children and adolescents to a growing brain. But if the kid is thinking about killing themselves, I'd rather give them ketamine than not. So again, using it in a thoughtful manner. OK, two other things. Uh, some, some clinicians are reporting success in dropping in a ketamine session into an ongoing psychotherapy, a depth-oriented psychotherapy, for the treatment of some personality disorders, cluster B stuff, narciss narcissistic, um, borderline, histrionic. So I'm not in any way meaning to imply that the ketamine is useful by itself, because it's not. They're using the ketamine as a lubricant to deepen or accelerate a psychotherapy process with the emphasis on the therapy. So the idea that you could send the patient for an infusion somewhere to go be cured of their narcissism, that's not going to work, I can tell you right now. Uh, but there is some interesting potential there. So then we come to really the critical question, which is, is ketamine useful and legal and ethical and appropriate for personal exploration? for spiritual growth. I, I think that it is. Uh, and this is a difficult thing to study, and so we're still learning about this. Uh, but that is really sort of the, the cutting edge of this field. Let me just check in for a second. Jordan, how am I doing? Doing good. 
Hey. Okay, content okay? You're going to do this, right? Or this if I'm yes. going in some sort of bad direction? Okay, right on. Just checking. You know, you never want to offend your host. Okay, right on. So what I'd like to do next is I'd like to, well, uh, let me back up. There's a lot of disagreement in the field about how to use this beautiful tool, ketamine. And so what I'd like to do next is I'd like to, to present to you three different strategies, three different paradigms, really, for working with ketamine uh, in, therapeutically. So as I go through these three different paradigms that I'm about to show, I want you to please listen for the different variables because there's a lot of variables in this treatment. So one of the variables is how are you putting the ketamine into the person's body? You know, what's the route? How much are you giving? What's the dose? How often are you doing it? Are you being attentive to the setting? I think setting is a really important uh, variable that's often underappreciated. And finally, something that I call clinical presence. Clinical presence in this context refers to what the provider thinks that their role is or how the provider is being with the patient who's receiving psychoactive ketamine. So I'm going to just show a quick slide here. I'm going to gloss over a little bit of it here, but I want to point out that ketamine facilitated psychotherapy is different and distinct from being a sitter. And here's why. Ketamine facilitated psychotherapy only occurs by a trained and licensed psychotherapist in the context of an ongoing psychotherapy where the, the provider or the, the therapist knows the internal emotional landscape of the client, of the patient, and also has permission to explore difficult topics. So that's different than being a sitter who's has a safety function or who's providing a loving presence and who's essentially following the patient, that's not the same thing as ketamine facilitated psychotherapy. So I want to mark that as distinct. Okay, so here we go. Uh, paradigm number one, this is called the NIMH protocol. So this was uh, approved, or the, the NIMH and the American Psychiatric In Association issued guidelines in 2017 giving the two thumbs up for this uh, as a, a, a way of using ketamine to treat depression. And so it's an infusion model. So in this way of working, according to this protocol, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to give 0 0.5 milligrams per kilogram of ketamine by weight, and then you administer it through an IV drip. The problem is, is that the dose is kind of low. It's a little on the low side, and it doesn't always do the magic thing that ketamine does. or It doesn't do it in a robust way in a single treatment. So the way that you get around this problem is you do a cluster or a series, and you try to make it cumulative. And so you're, you put six sessions, usually into two weeks, sometimes into three weeks. But you're doing six sessions close together, and the idea is that the effect is cumulative. In fact, you're putting more medicine in before the previous session has fully blossomed it, before it fully does what it does. It takes two and a half days for ketamine to fully blossom. So this is often done in an infusion center. Uh, and the key thing that you need to know about this is that this protocol is specifically designed to be sub-psychedelic. In other words, having psychedelic experience is considered a problematic and annoying side effect that you're trying to dose under. And so the idea is that you, you is to break up the medicine basically by putting it, in, in, putting it into six sessions so that you're getting enough medicine into the patient's body to do the magic thing that ketamine does, but without inducing psychedelic experience in any individual session. That's the whole point of this protocol. If you ask patients what it feels like, they say that it's that it sort of feels like having, uh, patients vary a great deal, frankly. But it's not uncommon for them to say that it feels like having two glasses of wine on an empty stomach. That they feel like a little bit nauseous, but it's not too bad. And they feel a little sedated, but they're still with you. Uh, you can talk to them. They know who they are. They know where they are, uh, et cetera. 
Here's, so this is fundamentally a medical or a surgical model. And if you ask providers who work in this way, if you ask them why the patients are getting better, what's causing the improvement, and 70% of the refractory dep depressed patients do improve with this treatment. I mean, the findings are remarkable. Um, but if you ask someone who practices in this paradigm how the patient is improving, they'll give you an explanation that's heavily biochemical with an emphasis on molecules and receptors and neurons, this kind of a thing. So there's no doubt that ketamine is doing something on a chemical level that helps people with depression and other kinds of mood disorder. But I don't think that's the whole story, frankly. And here's what, what's problematic. The patient is, is, in a, is forced into a passive position in this model. The patient isn't called upon to do anything except to show up for the appointment and then be hooked up to the infusion. But all the, all the magic is attributed to the medicine or to the doctor's skill in a medical model. So this isn't inherently a bad model. This is a good model for certain things. For example, if I needed a surgery, I would be very grateful to just lie there passively and not have to do anything. <laughs> I want you to do it. That's what I'm paying for, you know? It's not a bad model. It's a good model for certain things. But the question is, is, is this the optimal use of ketamine? Um, is this the optimal use for someone who's having a chronic mental health problem? So I think it's not. I, I think that empowering patients to show up and participate in their own treatment is a really important part of the treatment. So we're going to talk about a different model. Oh, haha, I just added this, I just added this uh, slide, uh, which is to say that S-ketamine, this nasal spray, is also very much in a medical surgical model where all of the magic resides in the molecule uh, and the patient doesn't have to do anything except show up for the, for the spritz. Okay. Same medicine, different philosophy. Same medicine, different paradigm. So the next thing I want to talk about here is ketamine-facilitated psychotherapy. So here's how we're doing that. Oh, we do it mostly with lozenges or IM. We prefer IM. Mm. So here are the main, this is a completely different idea. Here, the idea is to lubricate the psychotherapy process to help patients talk about material that is too painful or too shameful to get to otherwise. So the emphasis is on the psychotherapy and on the metabolism of psychological material. So I want to just contrast to the previous model, the infusion model, where there's no therapy, no talking. Okay, this is a talk-heavy approach. So patients report that when they get this, uh, that uh, so what you see really depends very much on the dose, and there's a lot of flexibility there. But what patients typically report is that they feel relaxed, and they think it's pleasant. They find it easier to talk. It's a little disinhibiting. That's what we're going for here. And here's what I want to say about this. Uh, we, never, we never go spelunking for new memories or material. That's really a bad idea, so don't do that. Uh, but rather, what happens spontaneously is something that I call consolidation. So consolidation, in my mind, refers to when the patient's uh, insight or awareness or sense of knowing moves from being intellectualized, and then with the use of ketamine and therapy, it drops into being embodied. I'll give you an example. Uh, I've had a male patient who, whose father left his family when he was a really little kid, and the patient believes himself to be unlovable. You've probably seen patients with similar kinds of concerns. And so the patient has issues with intimacy and relationship and commitment, et cetera, and so forth. Now, on, we've had, he's had a lot of therapy. And he knows, he, on some level, he knows that it wasn't his fault or probably wasn't about him that the father had to leave. But still, he is hung up on this. OK. Put a little ketamine in there. And then the patient revisits the material that they've already been working on, familiar material. And they go, oh, it wasn't about me. And they like get it as though it's for the first time, even though it's not for the first time. But it drops in their way of knowing. And you see that a lot. So that's what I mean by consolidation. That's what we're going for here. 
And I want to add that this is fundamentally a psychological or relational model, meaning that, uh, that each of us, the two people in the room, me, the provider, or the therapist, you know, there's a team of us, but the, the therapist in the room and the patient, we're each contributing 50%. We're both working equally hard during the session to help the patient. It's a different model. And OK, yeah, so as I said, and so when you ask providers who work in this way why the patient is getting better, they'll give you an explanation in terms of the metabolism of, of psychological material. It's a different idea. OK, let me move quickly here to another paradigm. Let me see where we are in space and time. We are OK. OK. Same medicine, ketamine, different paradigm. We're moving. Same medicine, different philosophy. You ready? OK, right on. So now we're going to talk about psychedelic ketamine journeys. Oh, that's probably why you all showed up tonight, right? OK, I got it. Sorry. OK, so you can do it in a big chair, but mostly it looks like this with the patient lying down. By the way, I just have to admit that this slide bothers me, and I keep meaning to change it because the patient's foot is cut off. And I've never actually had a patient with a missing foot, so there's something about that that doesn't seem realistic, but you get the idea. And then here, a little tribute to Alex Gray. Uh, I think that's what it looks like, what the experience is. That's a way of visually capturing it. But let's talk about that. So in psychedelic ketamine treatments, we are, uh, we are purposefully inducing psychedelic and mystical experience in the patient on purpose with the belief that the visions and the psychedelic component, that the visions are valuable and meaningful. So I want to contrast this with the two other paradigms that I've given you so far, where the visions are considered a problematic side effect that you have to work around. Okay? But in this paradigm, in this model, the visions are the main action. The visions are what you're going for. In fact, in a truly shamanic paradigm, the visions are considered a gift from God, and you offer up your body as a vessel to receive the gift. At least that's, that's, that's how I was trained. I was uh, apprenticed for a while to a, to a shaman in a different tradition for a while, which very heavily influenced my thinking. But in any case, so we primarily do this by injection, uh, and what happens is that the patient is partly paralyzed and minimally responsive to external stimuli for about 75 minutes, give or take. Uh, and during that time, they, what happens is that their the sensory input from, from their, uh, I can't think of the word I want, but perception, their input is, is calmed down and quieted. And then cognitive thought and all the chatter in your mind and sort of that thing that we think of as intellectual activity, that also is quieted. And the thing that makes you uniquely you, your essence, or your spirit, or your soul, or your awareness is released from your body temporarily to go have a little look around and then come on back. That's what people sort of, how people describe it. And uh, yeah, so people have these colorful, dreamlike visions. And it's my belief that the visions are meaningful and that the medicine offers a message. And after the patients come back, or I mean, they're, we're monitoring them very carefully the whole time. They're not talking during this. But as they come back, so as we do therapy the same day or the next day or in the next couple of days, the, the therapeutic task uh, is to, is to is, you're really doing Jungian dream interpretation 101. Uh, you are, I don't know what the visions mean, but I'm helping the patient to uh, construct something that's meaningful for them find meaning in the visions, and specifically to find something actionable. Find something that they can do in their lives on a daily basis that helps move them a little bit toward wellness. So in my opinion, this is the dividing line between what is recreational and what is therapeutic. It's that actionable step. It's identifying the message from the medicine and then implementing it in some actionable way in your life uh, and getting the support to do that. That's what makes it therapeutic, I think. So again, this is, as I said, this is fundamentally a psychedelic and shamanic model where the emphasis 
is on the healing action of the visions. Uh, and so if you ask providers who work in this way why the patient is getting better, they say because the patient had visions that were meaningful and the medicine helped them and told them to do these things. So I just want to pause here for a second and say that in, in reality, you know, in all honesty, the, the, I'm presenting them as different categories, and they're really not. They really overlap and blend. And what I mean by that is that when we're seeing a patient for psychedelic ketamine treatment, and we've decided that that's an appropriate, clinically appropriate, way of working with them. In fact, we of course are attentive to all the therapeutic elements, the interactions, holding the frame, of course, the relational component. And then the patient is having visions and we believe that to be meaningful. Uh, and there's no doubt, of course, that the ketamine is doing something on a biological level also. So in reality, all the different paradigms kind of blend together. I'm not meaning to say that it's one or the other. I'm just trying to get you to think about it from different angles. Uh, I'm going to skip that. Let me skip that. Let me, just, let me just touch on this really quickly. Some of you may have seen these slides before because uh, I gave a MAPS talk about this. I just want to very briefly mention a few of the um, th themes that come up very frequently in psychedelic ketamine treatment. It happens so often that it's remarkable, and I think it's interesting. So one of the things that people talk about the most uh, is that through a psychedelic dose of ketamine, that they believe themselves to be in the presence of God. And as I said before, how the medicine is doing that, I really have no idea. I don't think anybody knows. There's some guesses, but floating around. Um, but for someone who is suicidally depressed, it really is hard to describe how useful this phenomenon is when people experience their own divinity and their own, or a sense of the sacredness of their life a sense of that it has to be this way or that their life is meaningful somehow. And then sometimes that's the thing that you leverage in therapy to try to help the person engage in more treatment. Uh, as I said, it, ha it happens so regularly uh, when the setting is, when patients are appropriately selected and when they're adequately prepared and when they're embedded in a therapeutic relationship where there's a lot of love and trust, uh, et cetera. When you're attentive to all those variables, this is actually a fairly, consi I mean, a surprisingly consistent experience that people report. So this is my like all-time favorite quote uh, from a young woman, uh, very actively suicidal, and this was her experience. I'll let you take a look at that. That's what she saw. That's what she said. How is it doing that? I don't know. Uh, I'm going to just briefly touch on a few other things here. Here are some other common things that come up. So I want to comment on this. Uh, I know you folks are doing some really excellent work with psilocybin here. And what I wanted to say, uh, psilocybin is a little uh, maybe on the unpredictable side because there's it's such a wide variety of experience that people have. Is that right? But many of the serotonergic agents like MDMA, psilocybin, LSD, for example, they it seems, I'm not an expert in any of those things, but it, my impression is that those things offer the opportunity to take a psychological magnifying glass and kind of look at an element of your own life or a historical thing and kind of untie the knot. Is that right? It's like it can do that? No, you can do that. Okay. You can't really do that so much with ketamine. Uh, you know, it's, it's harder to do with ketamine. And here's why. Serotonergic medicines can take you toward your own experience, your own history. And ketamine does the opposite thing. It takes you away from who you think you are. Because when you're up in that psychedelic ketamine space, you've lost the sense of your story. It doesn't really even matter what happened in the past because all, none of that is important in that moment. It's all, it all just seems like ancient history, often. And it's incredibly useful therapeutically. So one thing that's really interesting is the possibility of combining some of these serotonergic agents with something glutamatergic like ketamine so that, uh, there's some qualitative reports floating around about that. I think there's something there that's useful. Yeah, oh. Are you combining it at the same time? Yeah. Well, again, would nobody, uh, so in a shamanic paradigm, I think they're given on the same day, not, ac not actually at the same time, but hours apart. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of work that remains to be seen about, about what's the most useful. Which one do you think giving first? I don't know. 
I don't know. I, I mean, I, I th I've heard a lot of, because ketamine is so short acting, you know, it's uh, there and back. There, there's a, a recovery tale, but the active dose is about 75 minutes. So what I've heard of other people doing is doing MDMA first with a shot of ketamine or psilocybin and then a shot of ketamine or LSD with a shot of ketamine. But again, these things, they're hard to study because they're, they're not really legal and you know, it requires all this bureaucratic red tape to be able to look at that. No. Anyway, this comes up a lot, super useful. And this. And this. I commented on this before when we were talking about anxiety, but ketamine is particularly useful in the treatment of bipolar patients uh, because it has this dual uh, energizing and also sort of calming properties. Why is this happening? I don't know, <laughs> but people report it a lot. Uh, just to touch on this, it, so more and more people are, uh, uh, clinicians are prescribing ketamine for use at home. So this is a standard practice in orthopedics and in physical therapy, not uncommon at all for patients to take ketamine daily for physical pain. There's some question as to whether this is a good idea in psychiatry, I don't know. But what I think is an even more interesting question is whether the ketamine is as useful when, when people are doing it alone versus when they're doing it in a supported environment. I don't know, this remains to be seen. I'm gonna skip that, skip that, okay. So really the, the main point that I wanted to make tonight uh, is that there are these different approaches to ketamine treatment. Uh, you can emphasize the, the biochemistry of it and the pharmaceutical intervention, or you could emphasize the psychotherapy component, or you could emphasize the visions if, you've, if you are comfortable going into that dose range. And so the question that I get the most as a as a ketamine specialist is, can I have some free drugs? And uh, the answer is no. <laughs> but as you can imagine, the question that I get the, the second most often after that one is, which one of these things works, works the best? You know, if I'm the patient, what dose should I have? If I'm the provider, what should I offer in my practice? And so, uh, so I'm gonna tell you the answer, are you ready? I mean, this is, the next slide is the big reveal. Are you ready? Okay. So the answer is that it all works. Different treatment for different people. The, the competent and skillful ketamine provider knows how to work with a variety, multiple routes of administration. No one of them is magic. Uh, and knows how to work with different dosing strategies. Sometimes really gentle, low-dose ketamine exposure, ketamine infusion, or this nasal spray business, this, that, and the other thing, sometimes that's just the right thing. You know, sometimes you gotta go in with a really gentle touch. That's great, we do, we do it. Some folks are tied up in knots emotionally, and what they, they really need to talk, and then we're using the ketamine to facilitate that. And other folks, and it's a very tiny portion of our practice, much smaller than you would think, but a tiny portion of our practice are really good candidates, frankly good clinical candidates, for full-blown psychedelic experience to Pluto and back in 75 minutes. And when that's clinically indicated, we do it. So that's, and so we, we, we have to do a training to get into the nuances of how you know the difference. But just to say that in my practice, we do it all because, because, because all of it works and all of it's useful and the key is to match the treatment to the person who's with you in the room at that time and figure out where you want to start, what you think is likely to be the most helpful and cost effective, that's what we do. So I'm maybe three quarters of the way through my slide set. I could kind of wrap it up here. Should we do that or you want to see the rest or what is your, Dr. Sloshauer, what are you thinking? It's going to take me like 15 or 20 minutes to finish the slide set, but I'm okay with just like leaving you with some resources and leaving it here uh, as you wish. Do you guys want to move into this session or see some more slides? Or, or, okay. All right, let's, so maybe we can go 
go Okay. I'll do my, so clearly I can't talk any faster, but I will uh, do my best to kind of speed through it. And thank you for your interest and for your patience. So just a couple of things here that I just want to, I'm going to just kind of run through this real quick. So <laughs> I have to tell you honestly that I am trained as a talk about your mother psychologist. And uh, I have a prime directive. Anybody else here watch Star Trek or Next Gen? Okay, I used to watch with my dad. So you probably know that a prime directive is an overarching principle that guides your, guides your behavior. So my prime directive is this, which is I think that we should always give the least amount of medication that we could possibly give ever to get the result that we want. Like I said, I'm a talk about your mother psychologist. But uh, anyway, look, if I can get the job done without medication at all, I'm all for that. Uh, that said, some people really need medication. And so I think we should make it available to them uh, as needed. So anyway, that's my, I always start as low as I can to go where I want to go. I want to say that all effective treatment, all effective treatment for depression begins with an excellent differential diagnosis. Because there's at least 14 different things that kind of look like depression, but only some of them are helped by ketamine. So before I ask the patient to throw down a couple thousand bucks, I, the thing is, I told you earlier I'm a control freak, but also I really like success. I really like clinical success. And so I want to feel comfortable that what I'm recommending is likely to be helpful. So you got to parse all this out. So we could easily spend an hour or two just on the slide. We're not going to do that. But just to say that, uh, you know, if the patient is hypothyroid, ketamine isn't going to do anything. If the patient is acutely stressed or having some sort of sleep problem, ketamine is not going to help. Uh, you know, if, if the patient is struggling with a, with a, a tr trauma type of situation, frankly, MDMA is a superior tool for the most part. We use ketamine because we can, because it's legal, but I'm not saying it's the best tool for the job, et cetera, and so forth. So all this has to get parsed out at the beginning of treatment to come up with an effective treatment plan. Super quick. Uh, so here are the patients who really make excellent candidates for ketamine treatment and who get a lot of bang for their buck. And those are folks where they have a, when they have that organic feeling to their depression, uh, and specifically marked by early onset, uh, family history, uh, they're body heavy in their presentation of depression, so their speech and their movement is slowed down and you can see that. And of course when people report that their uh, depression uh, comes and goes not in relationship to external stressors or stimulus. That's a dead giveaway that probably there is a biological or organic component here that is likely to respond well to ketamine treatment, uh, et cetera. We talked about this already, so I'm going to, I think we covered that. OK. These are just general guidelines. As I said, this is, this is a very nuanced conversation that requires more time. But just to give you something to work with, um, OK, I, so we don't ever see anybody who we haven't adequately diagnosed. And I mean diagnosed down to what we think is going on. And discuss with the patient our understanding of their suffering and, and then a treatment plan to systematically address it. There are some things that where someone is medically complicated, they need to see an anesthesiologist. That's beyond the scope of what we can do in an outpatient psychiatry practice. Um, you know, we, we've been quite conservative with respect to substance use. So we're, we're saying two years of, uh, of not current substance use disorder. Probably that's on the conservative side, and we may need to adjust that to something less uh, stringent. There's a whole bunch of medicines that are mitigators. They are not dangerous, per se, but they just make it not work. So I'll show you a list of that in a second. Uh, we talked already about dissociative trauma. But since Michael Pollan's book came out, you know, all of us out in California, we all got pollinated, namely <laughs> that we've got people calling left, right, and center all day and all night who want to come for, they want us to fix them with that silver bullet of psychedelic experience. Good luck with that. If you find a, if it actually works, let me know. I'd sign me up. I'll be the, at the front of the line. But as far as I know, it doesn't work like that. Uh, and so uh, we are not able to see people who want a shortcut or who just want ketamine but don't want to engage in any other part of their treatment plan. So real quick, uh, here are some of the mitigators of ketamine. 
Uh, and so they require, they require a dose adjustment. The only thing on this list that's actually dangerous with ketamine that you need to know is alcohol. Patients should never mix alcohol and ketamine close together uh, for a variety of reasons, respiratory depression, et cetera. Everything else on this list is, uh, is a potential ketamine mitigator. Um, pe the patients vary tremendously in their sensitivity to these interactions. So some patients tolerate it just fine, and other patients it kills the treatment. So we'll come back to this another time. Okay, I just only have a few things left to say here. So is this safe? Yeah, it's, you know, as far as surgical anesthetics go, it's pretty darn safe. Uh, certainly, ketamine treatment is, is safe uh, when provided in an appropriate environment by a highly trained person, as, as you are, or as you, as you will come to be as you learn about this. OK, but just like an appendectomy, you know, if, you, if somebody in here had acute pain and I, we had to send them to the, to the ER or the OR, I feel pretty confident that you would survive that without any incident because the per medical personnel are well trained for that. OK, that does not mean that it's a great idea to whip out your steak knives, watch a video on YouTube, and give it a wing ding in your dining room. And so it's the same with ketamine. You know, this is a really powerful tool, and some pretty terrible things can happen, and we're going to talk about that in a second. I think it's pretty safe as long as you're you know, careful and, and, and adequately trained. I think that when we talk about safety, we, there's a lot of emphasis on physical safety. And I don't think we talk enough about psychological safety. So here's what I want to say about this. Uh, ketamine in the higher dose range and an injectable ketamine is pretty freaking weird. And uh, so it really requires adequate psychological preparation. So we're not going to, we don't have time to get into the details of that right now. But just to say that it's important to be attentive to people's psychological safety. Uh, if you do this safely, it's going to be fine. And a lot of bad things happen to people when they're not adequately prepared. I want to just add that one of the dangers that we're getting into in this field is that because ketamine is legal uh, and people have more access to it, uh, the people are using it in, in a way. But I have to just say for the record that ketamine is really a terrible <coughs> entry point for psychedelic exploration because it's so weird. Uh, you're much better off starting with something that's less weird, like MDMA, and then sort of progressing, doing an arc from MDMA into psilocybin. This is just my opinion. Into LSD and then into ketamine or 5-MeO-DMT. My opinion is that there is an arc uh, of weirdness that it's a good idea to kind of be attentive to that so that you don't get into psychological difficulties. Am I allowed to say that here? OK, just checking in. A uh, couple of things. Uh, there are definitely some side effects, uh, some which are not life-threatening on the left side of the screen there. Those are all pretty common. And I want to say for the record that I have seen two medical emergencies earlier in my career, which put the fear of God into me and made me appreciate what a powerful medicine this is. And you have no business injecting people with ketamine unless you know how to assess and treat uh, these ki kinds of medical difficulties. And I, want, I also want to say that I don't know how to assess or treat them. I'm a psychologist. And thank God I work in partnership with some smart physicians. I'm going to pass that. Uh, ketamine is not super addictive. It, it doesn't pull for a physiological addiction. Uh, um, it is possible to be in a problematic relationship with it, as with anything. But it doesn't really pull for that. And so far, we haven't seen a lot. We haven't seen any uh, patients who are getting, receiving ketamine for depression who then convert into recreational users. At least, I mean, we're very attentive to talking to people about this. And that hasn't come up so far. I'm sure that now as ketamine and it's all over the place, I'm sure it's going to be a much bigger problem. Um, but anyway, I don't, I don't think it pulls for addiction. And lots of people use it without a problem. Um, we're going to skip that. OK. And then finally, here we go. Uh, let's, oh, this is about S-ketamine from last week. Yeah, you can look that up. There's a very intense REMS program that's going to be in place for S-ketamine. And if you want to read about it, take a picture of this, because this gives you the links to the, um, to the documents. 
Let me give you a moment to do that. Okay, and so as we bring this on home here, I just want to say that in my experience, I've been doing this for 17 years, by the way. <laughs> it's really a long time. And uh, in my experience, the patients who get well and who stay well over time are patients who do the other 90% of stuff on the screen besides the ketamine. Sadly, the ketamine alone is not sufficient to produce a lasting um, improvement. It's good as a bridge to kind of get things unstuck. But the patients who stay well over time do all the other stuff on this list. And I'm kind of famous for saying that ketamine should never be more than 10% of the treatment plan. Uh, and so the, the real work is to get people to engage in these other uh, supportive things that they need uh, in addition to ketamine treatment. That said, when we, have, we, we only have a few. But when we have patients who need ketamine in an ongoing way, and they're doing all this stuff, they're going to therapy and they're taking their oral meds and they're exercising, et cetera, and I know that's a lot to ask of someone who's depressed. But when people are actively engaged in their treatment plan, and if they still seem to benefit from ketamine treatment, then we're happy to make that available in an ongoing way, indefinitely, contingent on them doing the other stuff that they need to do. But we don't believe in giving just ketamine alone. Ketamine in the absence of the rest of the integrative approach. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about this too much, just to say that there's uh, that a, an area of great interest is uh, studying, and in particular quantifying, which is very difficult, uh, how the psychotherapy component may be enhancing what we see with ketamine treatment. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that, that the optimal way to use this tool is in, embedded in the context of a therapeutic relationship. Of course, I would say that because I'm a psychologist, right? So I have to acknowledge my own bias there. But uh, anyway, uh, this is an area for very rich uh, research investigation. And finally, let me leave you with some resources as, as I wrap it up. Look, I did it in less than 15 minutes. Good job, Raquel. Um, you can find a list of available books on my website. Uh, I, I, so the two on, on this list that I think are really excellent uh, is Dr. Hyde's book, The Black One, and then Dr. Wolfson's book here with the red sun on it. I'm actually in that one, by the way. Uh, but anyway, they're, they're both really relevant to what we've been talking about tonight. Oh gosh, I hope there isn't an author of one of the other books in the room. That would be bad. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, I run CREA Conference, which by the way was an accident. Uh, that was supposed to be a lunch for me and some friends that accidentally snowballed into an international event. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that on camera, but it's true. And so here we are going into our fifth year. So if, you're in, if what I've said today has piqued your interest, uh, then please come to San Francisco in November um, and join us for the gathering of, of the senior clinicians and researchers in this field. And finally, last slide, I just wanted to point you toward my website, kreainstitute.com. Frankly, I'm not the world's greatest web mistress. I probably should hire someone for that. But in any case, you can take a look there and you can find a couple of things, um, some articles and videos and stuff. Actually, last week I gave a talk, a similar talk, at the Brooklyn Public Library, which is available now online here. Uh, I maintain a list of providers who are psychedelic friendly or who work with ketamine in the context of psychotherapy. And so if you're looking for a provider, I'm about to add a whole bunch more, actually, of people that I met on this trip. But anyway, if you're looking for a provider where you can send referrals, I have a list there. Uh, the conference information all lives there. Uh, if you'd like to know about other events where I'm speaking, I, I have a mailing list. I use it probably three times a year. I'm, as I said, I'm not too much into that stuff. And finally, on my website, you can find my email address. There's a contact us link. And that goes directly right into my inbox. And I really do write back to pretty much everybody. So if you have a further question about anything that we discussed tonight, uh, or you want to send me hate mail or whatever, uh, that's, the, that's how you find me. And, and with that, I would love to say thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm happy to take some questions. <laughs> Jordan, you want to moderate? And I'll, I'll, I'll talk. And you, let's go back to the first slide.
D ketamine, uh, meaning deuter, uh, uh, dexter ketamine? Yeah, yeah okay, I'm happy to say something about that. Yeah. Okay, so we, we, uh, your question is, your question is, uh, has to do with the fact that ketamine is a racemic mi mixture of left-handed and right-handed ketamines, and they, for the S-ketamine product, they took out the right-handed ones. So you're asking, well, what about the right-handed ones? Okay, so there's been conflicting studies and research on this. Uh, some researchers found that S-ketamine, that's the left-handed one, that S-ketamine is more potent, more antidepressant, and less psychoactive. But other researchers found that the, the R-ketamine, also sometimes called D-ketamine, uh, it's very confusing, the naming system, uh, that has found that that's more potent and less psychoactive, this, that, and the other thing. So the answer is that nobody knows. Um, two different companies own the patents on these two products. The mixture of them, the cement ketamine is generic and dirt cheap, by the way, a buck fifty-nine uh, retail for a hundred milligram dose, as compared with S ketamine, which by the way is eight hundred dollars, I think, uh, five to eight hundred dollars for a dose, if you do the math. Uh, and so the answer is I don't know, nobody knows. Uh, it's possible that next year they're gonna come out with D ketamine or R ketamine suppositories and they're gonna tell you that that works even better. <laughs> so we'll have to see. I think there's a lot of marketing involved. I don't know. Uh, so. You said something about um, taking time to experience the fully blossom. Yeah. What, what do you mean by that? Yeah, and great question. How do you question. figure out what that window is? It's pure observation. So a couple, a couple of pieces of evidence that point in this direction. So first of all, clinically, what we see, uh, this is primarily with, with patients who have been diagnosed with a primary organic mood disorder. So the more profound the disorder, the more you see, the more evidence this is. If you give them a substantial exposure to ketamine, so not like a low dose, but a moderate to high therapeutic dose, which by the way is much lower than an anesthetic, lower than what they would do in the ER or the OR, what you see is something very distinct. Not a lot has been written about this, but what you see is that there are three coming up, three bumps up in mood and energy. Namely, a couple minutes post-injection or post-infusion uh, after you start it, after you start the drip. Somewhere in like at the 10 minute mark, people report that they feel better, like it starts to work. There's like a little coming up right there. And then four to six hours post-injection or post-infusion, so later in the same day, patients tend to get kind of agitated, and that's where you see more of the anxiety stuff come up. So it's really distinct, you know, it's, and it's predictable. 10 minutes, four, four to six hours, and then like two and a half days post-injection, like on the third day, that's like about as good as you're gonna get. That's as good as you're gonna feel. And it's a mistake for patients to assess whether the treatment has worked by looking at what happened like later that night or the next day, because it hadn't fully blossomed yet. <coughs> Interestingly, there's a study, and I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the author, where they took uh, either rat or mouse brain, I can't remember which one, they grounded it up, they stuck it in a Petri dish uh, in vitro, and they threw some ketamine in there. There's a famous picture of this. Uh, what they observed is that at two and a half days, the tips of the dendrites sprouted. And so you can see that some, some, I'm not a neuroscientist, so bear with me, that there's some biological process that happens <coughs> where, the, where the presence of ketamine um, you know what I, I mean, you the know what, Dendritic uh, arborization? Yeah, well, like uh, let, me, let me explain it the way the psychologist explains it, because that's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just a psychologist. But, okay, you've got a row of dominoes, you flick one at the end, and then the signal goes down the domino, and it takes a couple of minutes before the last one falls at the end. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the presence of ketamine touches off a chemical cascade, like a row of dominoes that involves um, mRNA and tRNA, Expression into protein synthesis, and then finally at the very end of the road, the, the tips of the dendrites sprout out and they form new neural connections. So we think that this has something really important to do with the biochemistry of how depression is improved with ketamine treatment. It may also turn out to be really useful in um, cognitive disorders, cognitive loss, like dementia. Uh, there's a lot of things that we're looking at. Uh, so that, anyway, that's a long answer to your question. But I think it's not a coincidence that what we see clinically at the two 
the day mark matches what they found with these mammalian cells in vitro. So there's something there uh, that just hasn't been written about a lot yet. That's what I mean. Jordan? Um, have, have they done any research with, or are you aware of any research where ketamine's been used for Alzheimer's or mm -hmm. uh, Parkinson's, ALS? Yeah, so the place to look for that resource is to look at the work of Rupert and Shane in Oxford. Uh, he had that idea and he's pursuing it. So that's outside of the scope of what I'm trained to do, so I don't really do that, but I'm following the literature carefully. Is there a style of psychotherapy that works better? No. Uh, I was trained as a contemporary relational uh, psychoanalytic psychotherapist, so that's what I do. And it's tremendously useful to have some theories of mind at hand that I can utilize for my own training to organize the stuff that comes pouring out of people. But I don't mean to imply that that's in any way better or different than you should just do what you feel comfortable doing. And if you're a CBT therapist and you know how to do that, right on. And if you want to do something else, that's great. Uh, there is, has been zero research looking at styles of psychotherapy. And my own personal opinion is do whatever you're good at and do what you're comfortable with. I was interested in um, what rescue medications do you have on hand, mm -hmm. and, how, and how often have you had to use them? Yeah, I got it. Okay, you ready for this? The, the question was, what rescue medications do you have on hand, and how often do you use them? So, yeah. So, uh, I moved into private practice at CREA Institute with my physician partner in uh, 2000. I think, maybe the beginning of 2016. Uh, and so, and we implemented at that time a new screening process, which I'm happy to share. Send me an email. And so following that, the number of patients in our private practice who required any kind of medical support or intervention, you ready for this? Zero, can you see that? Zero, none. Using a high dose, a relatively high dose injectable ketamine and also some lower dose stuff. And that's because we screen people really carefully. And if patients are medically complicated in any way, we automatically send them to the anesthesiologist for low-dose infusion so that we're not dealing with that in our practice. Uh, and what we have on hand, oh, God. Uh, we have injectable benzodiazepine. I think it's Ativan. We have clonidine. Is that right? Heart, blood pressure, lowering medication, injectable. Uh, we have Zofran for nausea. Uh, we have Zyprexa. Uh, oral for uh, for psychosis, again, we've never used it. Uh, we have blood pressure, we have a pulse oximeter, blood pressure monitoring equipment, uh, and probably some other stuff. Um, but it's, it really is an outpatient psychiatry and psychotherapy practice. And again, the number of times that we've had to use any of that stuff is zero. Prior to that, when we were, we didn't know better, we were taking all comers. Originally, we were were being diverted from the ECT program in our community at the hospital and sent to us. I was in a different partnership with a different physician provider. Uh, and we were doing in, uh, IV ketamine at that time in 2014, and that's when I had the two allergic teeth in, in the sleep. Uh, and part of that was because we took patients, I think, that medically we wouldn't take them. Let's hear these two questions. I saw a patient recently, I was a patient who, like an outpatient provider, was giving him like 18 sprays of ketamine per week. Um, and that provider, I noticed, was listed on your website. And I'm not saying it's your personal responsibility to curate that list and to that degree, but I guess that to me it begs the lar larger question of how as a community of providers should we try to discourage the kind of irresponsible use of ketamine and promote more responsible use because it has repercussions in terms of backlash and, and just the safety of patients. Questions. You want to hear some more questions? Or? Just hear this question and then. Oh, um, you mentioned.
mentioned earlier that um, the dosage for obsessive compulsive disorder is typically higher than in major depression. Mm -hmm. Can you have any idea why that is and what does that look like when it's aggregated? Okay, so, uh, so everybody's different. Again, again, so if we're going to start with the premise that you did go with some amount of medication and you possibly did. But that said, it's not uncommon to get up into the 1.25, 1.5, 2.0, about esketamine or the oh, yeah. intranasal synthesis. Hot. And you, you said that it's sort of at least being pitched in the first medical model. Mm -hmm. um, sure. I've heard that maybe in the community intranasal may be nice um, or have one advantage compared to say oral in that patients can titrate themselves to like a particular effect. Is that a thing? Is that at all valid or? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Slow Shower, since you asked, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to respond to that. I'm going to respond to that in a couple of ways. Thank you for bringing it up. First of all, you, you should do what is effective and what's cost effective. And so if your patients have insurance and the insurance is going to cover the esketamine, then by all means use esketamine. Nobody's telling you not to. What if the insurance isn't going to cover that? a long time, and we did this for a long time without expensive patented medicine, and that's what I intend to continue to do. I do. So that goes back to this, which we were talking about. Sorry, close your eyes while I do this. I don't want to hurt you. Um, there's got to be a better way to do this. Okay, there we go. What, what, I was, what I was meaning to, thank you for the question. What I was meaning to convey is that when people are body heavy in their presentation, it suggests to me, along with some other, oh, that's not the slide I wanted. <laughs> Sorry. I should look up before I. Okay, there we are.
Steve Arabani had me in their presentation. It suggests to me as a diagnostician that there's something going on that might be understood as a biological detector. So, so what, I'm, what I'm trying to figure out is, is this person grieving? Okay, that's going to probably most likely get better in time. And I'm not sure that you need to put ketamine in for that. I'm not sure you need to use medication for that. And is this person dealing primarily with trauma? Okay, then I might make a referral to one of the MDMA studies. Is the person in pain? Okay, you got to deal with that. Is this person angry? Okay, well, that would affect how I would use ketamine. So that would probably lean towards therapy, et cetera, and so forth. So I'm going down the list, and I'm trying to figure out what's going on here, and I'm trying to recommend a treatment that I think is going to work. So that's where I was going with that. Basically, we're, we're typically offering people a series of six low-dose infusions, or we're going to do six S-ketamine nasal sprays or whatever, six exposures, for three sessions of psychotherapy, uh, ketamine-facilitated therapy embedded in a larger context of therapy for three psychedelic journeys. You never do just one, because it puts too much pressure. I'll get to your question in a second. It puts too much pressure on the session to like be magical and amazing, and that never works well, so that's why we're doing it in a trio. There's actually a, something called the, the Bennett Trio, which I was just telling Dr. Sloshauer about over dinner. But anyway, uh, so we've had patients come in our practice since 2014 who come for psychotherapy, and we know that ketamine is available. And, it, and interestingly, some folks ch choose not to have any more ketamine if it works the first time, and they, but they don't feel like they need it or want it. They can't afford it. There's also a the reality. We, we have a sliding scale, so we try very hard to make it available. Uh, some people come back annually for a booster. Uh, it's not uncommon for people to come back quarterly for a booster or, or a period of some more help. And finally, as I said earlier, there are some people who come back monthly who seem to need ketamine or seem to need glutamate modulation on an ongoing basis. And as I said before, when people are actively engaged in their treatment plan and they're doing all the other stuff, but they keep sliding unless they get ketamine, for God's sake, give them ketamine, you know? It's like that one-tenth of the patient population who seems to need ketamine in an ongoing way. So we do that, but only as long as people are actively engaged in their treatment and are fully compliant with all the other elements of the treatment plan. So anyway, it's that 10%. question, I have the same problem with patients who present with anxiety. I have no way whatsoever of predicting who's going to benefit or who's going to get worse or who's going to need it over time. I really have no idea. Uh, I think it's yet to be discovered. I, I think we'll figure it out as we go. Thank you. So we'll take one you know, for each gentleman as we turn for a little while. Um, okay, so I am actually from a different context in terms of rotation. I
other than probably won't be helpful. Uh, and I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of, maybe I'm looking for that shortcut, and I feel like I've been stuck for a really long time, and, and I just want something to work, but um, I'm just wondering what your, your thoughts are. Also, he put it to me once, he doesn't want me to take any of them and feel like it's the drug that takes me, not the work. But I'm wondering if the drug is the only thing that would enable that catalyzation to be fixed. Well, to, to thank you for sharing. Two thoughts. Uh, number one, feel free to send in a copy of this video to explain the different ways of thinking about ketamine. Uh, and number two, I, unfortunately, I'm not able to do any legal consultation in this context. That's not legal. Uh, but you're welcome to send me an email and I'll follow up with you. Am I, am I able to respond to each other? Yeah. All right. There was no, uh, there was no, the founder had a hand up for a while. So easy. I was wondering if you could just. Uh, Oh, wait, here. Am I going to get in trouble? Hang a second. Uh-oh. Okay. <laughs> just, wanted to see if you were, just wanted to see if you were paying attention. Okay. Um, Anyway, let me end on that note. Please feel free to send me questions or be in touch. I'm pretty friendly. And uh, again, 